All right, today, 52SE, uh, special guest Joe. Uh, it's like all week, really. Uh, you get to learn all kinds of different things from uh, Joe uh, Caparetta from uh, Manhattan Aquariums, Unique Corals, and Marco Rocks, amongst a bunch of other stuff, actually. Uh, shares his experience with you guys on lessons from farming corals that make for a better reef tank at home. Hmm. All right, these are the questions we're going to answer. So get ready for all of this. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what makes uh, what's the best way to make a colony grow five times faster? We're going to hear uh, what's the bank of ion, uh, how to apply KISS, what is LARS, and how do we use it to solve small, identifying the difference between a winning formula, settling for less, and then chasing fads, difference between all this stuff, and who are the most productive employees on the farm? Hint, they work for poo, algae, and parasites. <laughs> 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 all right, so these are all things that when you do it for a living, and I, this is one of the things I really like talking to people like you because, you know, this is one of those weird areas where, you know, success really means profitability. So if you weren't doing this well, you wouldn't even exist. Right. 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 You're, you're farming. If you're not doing successful methods and you're producing them fast enough, like, and that's whatever you guys are all after. I want them to grow. I want them to be colorful. I want them to get in shape. You're producing all those things yep. or you wouldn't exist. Yep. All right, so number one, uh, what is the best way to grow a colony five times faster? Is that what it really says? Because I <laughs> No, um, five times faster. Man, those are some, those are some serious challenges. Now, the, the proven ways to grow corals faster, obviously, is by doing everything that a coral would need to grow faster. Maintaining a higher pH, higher nutrition, higher lighting. Uh, and then one of the obvious, well, maybe not so obvious things is instead of letting a coral grow from a, fra uh, from a small colony up, if you take it and chop it into a bunch of pieces and let it grow together, it's been demonstrated that the coral will grow a lot faster. You have a lot more surface area. And when the coral joins together, all that surface area is now joined and the coral just grows faster. Okay, so there's a couple ways to look at this. Now, uh, one is uh, I could actually get five frags. Right, and so if I got a single frag and then I surrounded it with four, it's obviously going to grow into a colony yeah. faster, right? But it's like you would think of it as five times, but it's actually like exponential mm -hmm. because once it like you know gets that kind of colony shape, it just starts to take off, right? Well, yep. Yeah. What we find is is the best way to produce frags is to let a, let a coral grow to a certain size where it has like a critical mass. And then if you take the outer ring of that coral, you could take a Montipora or a large acro, like we have a red robin acro, it's probably two feet across. We will snip the entire, well, it's not really growing like a Monty, so it's got these fragments that are growing out. We'll snip probably 30 frags once a month, and within three to four weeks, it's completely grown back. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, you know, that one coral is constantly producing 30, 40 frags a month. That's a ton of frags. So I heard the same way from uh, uh, a local guy in the club. Uh, he says that what he'll do is again, is you know use five frags, not because he wants to grow it faster, but because he doesn't want the weird frag shape. Okay, yeah. You know, so we buy it in frags because like, that's just the way you get it, yep. you know, and you're gonna get small ones, you know, it's just, one little tip of the yep. thing, right? Okay, but then it kind of like has to grow up and then decide when to branch or whatever. Yep. If you actually stick, you know, five of them together, it will create a colony right yep. away and so grow true. naturally. Yep, right? yep. Okay, the part that I didn't think about it until you just said it was, I could theoretically actually just take that small frag, you know, and break it into even five smaller frags, which almost sounds like blasphemy. <laughs> Uh, but then glue those things down, you know, and then those things will then grow into yep. a colony. Of course, it immediately will look terrible. Yep. Uh, it'll look like little bits, whatever. And there's ways to do it. Like in the ocean, they're suspending corals from a string or from a line. So now you have corals growing 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. You know, every side of that coral is exposed to water and nutrition and food in the water column, and it's just growing faster. And it's also out of the way, so benthic or, or pests that are crawling can't go up and reach it. So I think we'll start to see more farms or more people employing that method where you have like a PVC line across the tank with fishing line going down 
and coral polyps, corals glued to it. And you can adjust the height in the water column very easily. The flow is not a problem. You have 360 degree growing. We don't do that just because it doesn't look good. Um, and we don't need to be the guinea pigs for everything. Yeah. But, you know, this is how it's done professionally in, in, in the ocean. Well, so have you seen uh, yeah, top shelves like uh, facility before? With the with the PVC structures. They're like little trees yeah. that come out. Kind of yeah. does that without the string. Well, I think the beauty that they have there is that those PVC pipes allow them to take their colonies in and out to be able to frag them. Uh, and they could also move it as corals grow together. They can move the arms, you know, because it's locked together, but I don't think it's glued. So when I saw it, I, I thought, okay, so hey, man, it's not on frag, you know, rack. It's not on a rock or anything. They put in this colony like out in the open, you know, so it can get flow and everything oh, all yeah, around it sure. in the same way. It's not yep. upside down, like hanging yep. like a, from a yep. string or whatever, but like it's still kind of yep. adapting a little bit of that. Anytime you can get that coral up into the light, into the flow, it's, it's going to respond with faster growth. Okay, so one of the things, I don't know this to be true in this case, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. So uh, I swear I think I've heard a speaker talk about this before, but I, I'm going to hear your thoughts on this. So if I were to take that, I, th I think it was Kelfo. That I heard it was says. in his book. I think I know where you're going to go. Okay. Take it, slice it like this, like a cucumber. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Well, that's an interesting way. way I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I cut you off then. I'm sorry. Okay, no. Uh, that if you cut it into little bits, that they essentially will have like a, they need to get to a certain size to survive. And so they'll spend like uh, energy into growing the tissue and basing out. So when you took that one frag and you broke it up into the five little bits and then glued them around, they'll actually spend energy growing to like merge to each other mm -hmm. to create that thing faster than they would if, if you had uh, done just the one. Yeah. yeah and, create artificial amounts. And of I don't know the mechanism or why, but it just is what it is. It's just been shown over time, over and over that uh, the same coral, sliced up, glued, and allowed to grow back is going to grow faster. You know, I, I, a lot of, Kelfo hasn't like been the forefront here yeah. for a while, but like I used to go to all those little seminars and fragging and stuff. I remember reading his book and, and yeah. those techniques to increase growth rates. And so I just remember him saying, you can slice it like this, or you can slice it like a cucumber and then glue those pieces down. There were so many little things. Like I watched the thing and I immediately went out and like started slicing, you know, <laughs> rose bubble tip and enemies yeah. after he like he did the math. You split them in half once every month. Yeah. That you have a thousand a month at the end of Crazy. the year. If yeah. you just left it versus leaving it alone. Yeah. Okay. And then like then he showed and I went and saw it afterward was uh, on like euphilia. If you they bud little heads out the yep. side that just die because they are you know shaded from themselves, right? They don't always die, but you're the ones that are shaded, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of them will just die. Yeah. Uh, but if you turn the stick on its side, all of a sudden you know they're getting exposed to light and yep. they'll they'll live. But eventually it'll grow up here, and then you got to kind of turn it the again. You know, keep yep. exposing the actual skeletal structure, yep. and they'll keep budding out these little things. Yep. yep. Uh, and you know. It was just like such an interesting thing to hear, you know, the different ways of doing yeah. it. But yeah, you want to grow a colony five times faster. We think of calcium, you think of alkalinity, you think of getting the right light. Reducing the limiting factors, yeah, uh, yeah. And also maintaining a constant microenvironment where trace elements are going in all the time. You know, a good two or three or four part where they're going in every day, not waiting for a water change to replenish those vital trace elements. Like it's been shown or uh, that uh, fragments, frags, need strontium to lay down new layers of growth. And the reason why corals need to encrust first is because if a coral was to just grow up and not have a solid base, well, what happens the first time a storm comes or a good wave comes? That coral's getting knocked down. So it's got to lay down a nice, thick bed first to prevent it. But it's also reacting to the specific location that it's in. So in that tank, if you don't have a lot of current, it might not need to grow as thick and it might not need to grow as large of a base than if the current was maybe a little bit gentler. So the coral's constantly adapting as well. So if I had a one inch frag, and I wanted to do what we were just talking about because I did want to do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what would be the best way to break it into five pieces? Immediately I'm thinking, you know, the little bandsaw thing, but is it better just to like with a clipper and just break it? I don't think it matters. I mean, both work really well. You know, the, the snipping obviously works. Uh, the bandsaw cuts it quick and clean. 
Uh, but with a thin coral, the, the clipper is so easy. I just uh, yeah. snap it. Yeah. Okay, I just, uh, I, I, I don't really want to watch this. I want to like get two frags of the same thing and put one down and then right next to it, put one where I broke it up into five little bits and like, you know, see which and one. And take another one and just lay it down and glue it like that. Because oh, now you have all the surface area. Well, this is what Calfo was getting to this. The more surface area you have exposed to light energy, the better. Because if you think of an acro like this, the light is here. How much surface area is hitting it? Only the tip, the axial coral light. Well, everything else is kind of getting indirect light. So now this axial coral light has to kind of produce food for a lot of everything else that's starving. But you take that acro and go like this, and when you think about it in the wild, when a wave action happens and corals get broken down, do they land like this? No, they land like this. So naturally think, speaking, a coral is going to respond and grow faster in this position. So this but is it doesn't one, look as good. This is one of those things that like, I think about a lot lately is just, you don't, most people don't think of, they think of the coral as an animal, right? But in reality, each individual polyp is its, its own a, animal. It's a colony, yeah. Right? Okay, they do share resources, like yep. you said. It will yep. like send resources down. But like what I think about when we shifted from these big banks of T5s and stuff, and then like we shifted down to these like little pinpoints of light and stuff, because they look visually about the same in the tank, but like biologically, nothing yep. like that. They create huge, huge shadows in it. So what we've done is we've really thought like, well, I guess I really only care about the animals on the surface. I don't care about any of the animals on the inner network of this coral. I don't care about any of the animals on the bottom or the base of the coral. All those polyps, like, they can just starve to death. <laughs> and the coral, to the best of its ability, will, like, actually try to send its nutrients down there as well, right, and share the available resource. They're really just kind of starving the top now, too. And, it, and it, I, I don't think it can if there's not enough energy to support the top as well. So it's got to kind of pick. And that's when you see these the undersides. And when you look at a healthy tank, there's healthy tissue going all the way down. It's not like where it's healthy in the top and then it's really a lot of recession. You know, there's not enough energy to support the entire colony of the coral. I remember seeing uh, the Triton tank when I was in Germany and he had the Lani lights and the goal there was to mimic T5 blanket lighting. So every square inch of that surface area had a diode and it did similar to what the T5s do. It sends light everywhere. And with the white sand, the light would bounce off the sand and hit the undersides. Sure, it's not as bright as at the tops of the coral, but you're providing some light energy to the undersides of the coral, as well as blanket lighting everything. Because as the corals grow up, you constantly have shading. So you might have good coral when you, uh, good lighting coverage when you start, but as you get some shading and angle growing, if your point source light is here, I don't care what kind of reflector or spread you have, the light photons can't hit the coral that's underneath it. Mm. It can't bounce around it. So you need a light source that can hit everywhere. I just think of it this way is the light source needs to be bigger than the object you're trying to illuminate. Yep. The object I'm trying to illuminate is the aquascape. Yep. And so if I make the light source as big as the tank, it inherently does that, yep. uses the glass reflection to some degree. But yep. when you see those tanks, you know, it illuminates those animals on the bottom and they base out and they're super healthy. Mm -hmm. You see the ones that don't, the inner network of the skeleton's all dead, the yep. base is all dead. Yep. And then like lo and behold, one day it just like collapses under its own weight. Right. Like the whole colony just dies. Right. Well, right. they just weren't caring about its biology. That's a whole nother conversation. Yep. But yeah, that's how you grow a coral five times faster. Next, the one here is, what is the bank of ion? And I love the way that uh, like you just chose to describe this because this is a concept everybody's familiar with, but not thinking about it in this frame of mind. I actually never- Bank of ion. I, I, that came to me as I was writing it, um, the bank of ion. It's like your, your, literally your bank of ions. So the way to think of it is you've got calcium at, say, 440 or 450. Um, you've got strontium, you've got potassium, you've got molybdenum, all the ions that you need, the major and the mi minor. And they're all at a certain concentration in your water column. It doesn't matter if the tank is 10,000 gallons or 10 gallons. That's the concentration in that tank. So now if you have X amount of biomass and you have a bigger bank at the same concentration, there's more for those corals to pull from. So what we're getting at with this is the more water volume you have in relation to the amount of corals you have, the more stable things will be. Because when a coral pulls calcium out of the water column, well, it's, if it's a very 
small amount of water for say a five inch coral, as it pulls calcium, the calcium needs to be replenished quickly. But if it's almost an endless amount of water, like we have 2000 gallon systems in our raceway, you know, one coral pulling calcium out, you can pull for days and days and days and the calcium barely moves because the bank of ion is so big and so robust. So having that water volume, well, first, it's very resistant to change and we want to create a stable environment, but your your alkalinity, your calcium, your potassium, all the ions that the corals need will fluctuate less the larger water volume you have. So basically what he's saying, saying just that is that whole, if you've always heard this, a bigger tank is more stable. Yep. The bank of ion is like a concept to wrap around is like, I have all of this, you know, ionic cash you know in there that you know if i only had uh you know the bank was only so big and i had a hundred in there well like i'm gonna go deplete that really quick if i had a million in there it really would never matter right, right? even though you're taking them out the same amount it's it's it, it, yeah like deduct just a dollar a day and yeah. if i had a million ions it like really doesn't matter right but if i only have a hundred i'm gonna go down fast yeah i also think of like the bank of ion now is debt too because I'm kind of like depositing pollutionary ions every day, yeah. right? And at some point I need to do something to get rid sure. of that like yep. uh, ionic debt. <laughs> yep, the dilution principle, you know, yeah. flushing stuff out. Filtration, yep. dilution, you know, uh, refugium export, whatever yep. it might be. I need to do something to, you know, get beyond yep. that. But now, like I I've seen this so many times where like small little nano tanks and stuff like they just don't they look they do really really well for like a year and then they just crash like somebody like you just forget to do something like a, you know i always think like a, the worst thing could happen to your tank is like a great barbecue season you know <laughs> like, just like i'm having a great time yeah. i want to do water yeah. changes yeah. right and the better it does the more it's going to need you know when as the coral's growing it needs more and more replenishment so your your daily regimen three months ago is different than your daily regimen now because you need twice as much or three times as much minerals to go in more traces to go in because the corals have grown they've They've reacted to your husbandry methods, methods from months ago, and now they need three, four times more. So uh, most of you are familiar with the E170. So the E170 is a tank I had in my office that was for the ULM series. And uh, it was a, uh, you know, I don't think this was like 40 gallon tanks from Red Sea, mm -hmm. right? It was a full blown SPS tank. It had no filtration on it, no filter sock, no skimmer, no mm. nothing. Man. The only thing that was running on that thing was the uh, auto water change. Okay. And so, you know, I was also doing that, like, I think it was two part or something mm -hmm. too, but like, you know, to replace calcium alkalinity. But the rest of it, the ionic bank exchange I was making was doing from just water changes. So I was managing my pollutionary ionic debt and yep. I was also managing all the other ions, you know, because this is a really small amount of water with a lot of coral in it. So not what everybody knows, like we've shared this in a few videos, but uh, probably not everybody knows this. We actually moved that tank out of my office into the studio here. Uh, and when we did that, we didn't set up the out of water change on it and it crashed within yeah. a month. I mean, you know, isn't, yeah, at the end of the day, that's it, what we're we trying just to replicate. We're doing it by hand every day. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. auto water change made sure that happened every single day and in a really small volume of water, yeah. you know, made our transactions with the Bank of Ireland <laughs> and kept, consistently. Kept it even, yeah. Yeah, but like after we got rid of that and we weren't doing that because we just hadn't gotten around to setting it back up in here and rerouting the cords, you know, the tank crashed because yeah. it was so reliant on that. Uh, that would have never happened on a much bigger tank. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then, you know, that also goes to, to say like, maybe we don't need to fill the entire tank with corals. So if you have like a 150 gallon, really pick any size tank, instead of trying to maximize every bit of surface area, if you just have a few key rock bombies or areas of focus, you can, <coughs> excuse me, have blanket lighting over those areas, but have a lot of open negative space. Now your coral coverage in relation to the amount of water is in your favor. So it will be a little bit less, the, the ions will fluctuate a little, little 
less. I'm depositing a, a small amount of bank of or a small amount of money in a very yeah. large bank. Right, right. Uh, in the E170, man, like there was like almost more coral than water in there. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the auto water change dude did it. Yep. But as soon as that was gone, it was gone. Yep. But that's the same thing I see in smaller desktop tanks is they do great when like you're just doing these water changes, you know? And so behind you, there's like a, a nano there. And one of the things we discussed is like, I mean, like people sell these little skimmers and stuff mm -hmm. you can do for them. What if instead, man, for the filtration for that thing, all I did is I put a five gallon reservoir and a five gallon uh, bucket of fresh salt water in there and put a couple of dosing pumps on it to, to do perform auto water changes. And on a 10 gallon ish tank, I'd only have to fill those, change those two buckets out like once a month, mm. you know? So once a month, go refill the salt water one and empty the dirty one. And I'm now performing like 12% water changes weekly essentially you know, yep. there's 10 or something i forget the exact yeah. math yeah. but like i and i can do that 12 times a year mm -hmm. you know even the barbecue won't get me on that right. one you right. know right. Uh, I, and like that is you know i don't need a pretty fancy skimmer or yeah. any of that stuff i just need two reservoirs a couple of dosing pumps yeah it's like an open system at a public aquarium where they're using natural seawater pumping in you know, mechanically clean it, sterilize it, but but you're using those ions or the saltwater wells that are all over Florida for the aquaculture facilities. They're not mixing up salt water at some of these farms. They're using the natural saltwater well to flush through and give them that constant level. Um, if you look up the concentration principle and the dilution principle, those are the two that come into play. Every time you're doing a water change, you're concentrating ions because you're adding them from your good salt mix and you're diluting the waste elements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as you, that balances the needs of that specific aquarium, constant water change is the, is the best. So I always think of this, like, sometimes I wish like we could say, you know, council, like with the ferocity of, please just do this. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. like this isn't like a, one of these things, well, I mean, I could listen, maybe I not listen, whatever, like, just do this and you'll be so much more successful than people that don't. Yeah. So if I had a really small bank, like my 10 gallon tank, you know, uh, and the only thing that you did that defined auto your success. Auto deposit and auto withdrawal. Well, there's an auto water change piece, but like, like barring all the equipment. Yeah. Okay. If I just had a pinch grip, you know, like a one gallon pinch grip and I had a five gallon pail next to it, like, and once a week, I just dipped the pinch grip in there, dumped it on the sink, dipped it in the bucket, and dumped it in, yep. man. Yep. I uh, did my 10% water change every week. The chances that you are successful, and you do this 50 times a year, you know, it takes minutes. Yep. No hoses, no nothing, man. Just dip, dip. Yep. Right? If you did that consistently, you are going to be on a, such a different, dramatically uh, yeah. uh, six, different success rate than everyone else. I think the smaller the tank, the more appealing that is because the cost of your RO system and your salt is much less. Now, if you got into like a 2,000 gallon system and we've got to change this, now your salt adds up. So now we're looking at other ways, more creative ways to replenish. You know, on 12,000 gallons, it would be kind of costly for me to do to employ that. But on the smaller scale, use that to your advantage. It's 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 better than buying the socks and buying this and all the different pieces of filtration that you got to upkeep. So that's one of the lessons that I learned. You know, I brought the 360 to my house, right? Is I've always been told bigger is better, more stable, all that stuff, right? Okay, and you know, bigger is more fun and all the other things. And the one thing that I learned is that is true until you get to the point where you are no longer willing to do your water changes because they're too big. Mm -hmm. Now there's a whole different method you need to employ, yep. right? And yep. we can discuss that. And Even buying two part gets expensive. So now you look to the long-term value of a calcium reactor where the cost of the media is, is pennies compared to two mm -hmm. part solutions. There's totally different methods now. Right. You're going to change everything. Yep. Right. Yeah, at what point, and it's not like you enter this gallon range and everything switches. It's like this gray, this constant gray area. You got to know when it is the right time to switch for you. So in my mind, you know, I got to the point where it's like, all right, so if I was going to do 10% water changes on a system that with the sump and stuff was probably really around 400 gallons, I mean, I'm going to do a 40 gallon water changes weekly. I'm going to do 160. I'm using a bucket of salt a month. 
hard stop right there. Yeah. That like, I don't want to do, I don't want a container in my house, man. It's more than 160 yeah. gallons, yeah. right? Right. Uh, and so like, cause right around 160 gallons is where you can't even get a container that fits through yeah. a normal size door. Yeah. Right? Even the 160 gallon one, I think you have to get a specific one that, like, and you have to take the door <laughs> off, you know? Uh, so in a home environment, that's my limit. Is yeah. I wouldn't go any bigger than that in vast majority of cases, yeah. unless you know what you're getting into. Right, right. Uh, so big, 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 big bank of ion gets bigger yeah. until new problems develop yeah. from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thankfully, the, there's other methods that employ little to no water changes and ways of dealing with waste and uh, trace element replenishment. But that's probably for another episode, right? That probably is. Okay. Uh, all right, so the next one here is, I'm super curious how you apply this from a, like an operational facility to home, but how do you apply the KISS you know, method of keep it simple, stupid? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, I see a tendency for people, especially first world problem, they have extra money, they wanna buy everything. They wanna buy every filter. They don't really know what they need or, or if they need it. And the tank becomes a science experiment. And we've all seen the person with the 30 gallon tank that's got the oversized filter and the controllers here and the cow smacker there and the two part here and the generator here and the controller and the chiller. It's like, dude, what, what are you trying to create here? You're trying to create something visually pleasing or a, or a lab science experiment. So it comes down to variables as well. The more variables you have on the system, every piece of equipment you employ adds an inherent a layer of variables. The more variables another you have. Another skill set to learn. Another skill set and more things that could go wrong. Because now everything is, is one moving balanced equation. And now you've got to maintain all these things to still keep that balance. So if you can achieve the results with less, well, that's going to increase your odds of, of being successful. So get a filter if you truly need it. If you don't need the fleece roll filter, don't get it. Why maintain it? If you're keeping fish that may not usually get sick, like eels hardly ever get parasites. Do you need a UV to keep them healthy? Probably not. You know, so look at what each piece of equipment does and is it specific to your needs for your aquarium and the animals you're keeping. Mm -hmm. The less equipment to maintain and clean, trust me, the better. So at our farm, we only employ what we need because I don't want to pay money to clean it, to service it, to replace parts. And when it does go wrong, it can trip up the entire system. So unless it's paying rent, we use that, that term a lot, it doesn't, it's got no business on our, on our farm. So it's interesting because I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yet a lot of our content, man, I would not call it KISS content. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're really diving into the biology. We're thinking about the problems we face. And we use a lot of technology to like try to solve the fact that we're trying to keep, you know, fish and coral alive here in Minnesota yeah. off the reef. Right. right. And for a prolonged period of time, you know, and, you know, solve some of the problems that are going on. And one of the things that like, you know, it's impossible for me not to think about is that, you know, historically, you know, it's been said that nine out of 10 people fail in the first year. Now, if I were to think about the one in 10 that like is successful at that year, it's people that are like, have an acute attention to detail and are watching every little thing that's going on with this yeah. tank, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because, you're not going to apply all that technology in the beginning. You're definitely not going to apply it all right. You know, they've you also picked a it. method and a system that matches the the level of care that they can provide. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't provide the needs for a high energy SPS system, then don't go with one. And chances are you'll be more successful by getting one that matches your budget, the time you have, your family constraints, you know, stuff like that. So, like. Uh, somebody said on the uh, on the the Predator tank that this was the most over-engineered tank mm -hmm. you know possible, which is like the exact opposite of Kiss, yeah. right? And so here is like the conundrum that I face, right? I am not going to hover over the tank and watch it 24/7. I'm not in a point of life where that's possible, man. I got three little kids running around pulling mm -hmm. me in every direction, mm -hmm. like, that's just never gonna happen, yep. right? Okay, so I've got to address that as a reality of my life, yet I still want to do these things, right? And so, 
man, like I need to maintain water. I like the auto water changer now. Like, yeah, I'm dependent on those pumps to work, but I actually think that that pump is more dependable than me. Mm-hmm. Like I am not dependent to dependable to do this every weekend because yeah. I get pulled everywhere. Right. I, I, I see what you're saying. I think the needs of a commercial coral farm are different. And I think, when you're relying on staff, say a staff of 10 or 12 employees, you're not making the small decisions for them. And to maintain this equipment takes a lot of effort and attention to detail. And yes, that equipment is taking the place of man hours or people. I found that what works for me and I see it working for others is the less you have to maintain, the less equipment, the less that can go wrong, the more successful you'll be. But we have people full time watching these. And the other added benefit is it keeps the staff engaged and intimate with the systems. When they're too busy relying on cleaning equipment, modern equipment, changing valves, doing this, changing sensors and probe, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'd rather them be doing the water change themselves, dosing the stuff themselves. I think WWC, you know, they don't even use any controls there. He's like, I got people. I want people testing. I want people engaging, looking at that color. Mm-hmm. It just keeps that bond tight. But I also sympathize, and I've seen very successful tanks that have good monitoring systems, that have a lot of equipment like the Predator tank. But you have to be willing to set it up right, keep it clean. And that's another problem. If you're splashing everywhere and you can't control drip, your equipment's going to go to shit. Mm -hmm. Everything there, your controllers, everything is going to turn to crap. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of staff are not that clean. They splash everywhere. They don't go back and wipe it up. And I hate to sound like I'm poo-pooing on staff, but that's just human nature. You know, and a lot of times they don't care as much of a business as a business owner. And I'm going to go ahead and poke the bear here. Okay. So you brought the word controller. This is like one of those like hotly debated yeah. things possible. Right. Uh, you know, you're like, do you need a controller or not? Can you need a controller? And like, first off, like I've said this many times, you all have a controller unless you are plugging in your lights at 9 a.m. and pulling the plug. Uh, whatever, You've you got a controller. A controller. Yeah, it's yeah. just like the, the quality of the controller is the question. Correct, right? correct. Uh, okay, so, and then like, are they redundant and backed up and stuff? Okay, so this is like basically what you just said. It's the same thing that Worldwide said, and a lot of people are going to believe, and they're correct, you know, if you apply it to your own instance where it's correct for you, and there's other instances where it's not. Mm-hmm. So, like, for instance, people ask all the time, you know, like, I don't know, can I have a reef tank and still go on vacation? What's your answer? Yes, absolutely. How? You need a controller. Okay. Or a trusted neighbor. A tr- yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which is hard. <laughs> That's the end. Like, if you're going to be away, like, right. there's a hope and pray method. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave and just hope it all pans out. Yep. Right? Okay, so let's apply that. Like, you, you guys hear, like, my accounts all the time. And I talk about controllers all the time, and, like, on all my tanks. I'm going to tell you why that is. And it goes way beyond like, cause we sell them. Right. And it, like that's just garbage. What it is, man, is that you're a product of your environment, which is here at BRS, we have all of these tanks. Nobody is here from the hours of, you know, that take care of tanks anyway, from 5 PM until 9 AM. Nobody is here on Saturdays and Sundays mm-hmm. or holidays. So if you do the math on that, we're not here 100 days a year caring for this Mm -hmm. tank or more. And if you do the after hours bit of it, five of six hours for, or five, six the time, we're not around these Mm -hmm. tanks. Mm -hmm. Yet all those tanks that we did, man, right. Yep. Right. So like we were able to keep the 160 for five years or for eight yep. years. We're keeping yep. the the uh, clown harem tank, you know, for five years. You know, the 750 that you built the aquascape and like all these tanks, dude, are like, you know, these things have saved the amount of oh, times that at 2 a.m. we had to come in here and do something. Our systems, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We so, still run uh, the monitors and, and stuff. We, we use controllers. Um, I don't want everything controlled. You know, yeah. like there, there's a level of comfort. And I think I'll, it's different for everybody. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, like, here's a, a good example. Like, I mean, how many times has an auto top off been, like, overfilled, mm-hmm. right? And uh, because of that, the alarm went off on it, and the solution was unplug it. Mm-hmm. 
How many times have you forgot to pl plug it back in? Oh, sure. Right? Sure. Okay, so, you know, in, you know, alternative to that, there's such a common, common thing that there, you just go up to a button and just say, hey, man, just turn this thing off for an hour and have it turn back on. Is that KISS? Or is we're trying to remember to come back and plug that thing in, KISS? Right. Now the, in a home environment. Yeah. A home environment is a little bit more unique. It's a little different. You can really control everything much better. My home tanks, I had everything dialed in. The service tanks I would do, I would keep everything clean. I would stay until I had no more splashing. Everything would be covered. And you can maintain that pristine environment that's needed much longer. Commercial setting, it's always been so elusive. It's, it's much more difficult. Okay, so this is the, the bit that like I wish would happen in the community. And like, people have heard this a hundred times out of me at this point, but I'm just going to keep saying it. I wish when we had these conversations about KISS and controllers and technology and redundancy and all this other stuff, the answer wasn't like just my way and your way. Because like my way, when I started this, man, like, you know, like I didn't have any responsibilities, man. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, I, you know, like, was young and just like had a real simple job and mm -hmm. like I just took care of this tank and attention to detail it just works right okay later on in life that doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. for me so like if the answer was you see this conversation is like hey do I need controller like I don't know tell me about like how often are you away from the tank you know you know what are you gonna put in this tank yep. you know whatever like ask some questions about that person yep and not like in relation to me mm -hmm. like my decisions and mm -hmm. what I did but mm -hmm. like Hey man, what are your needs? Yeah. Because I've been doing this long enough that I could probably shape my curtail my counsel to you and yep. like what would best help you. Yep. And if I best help you, I'm gonna best help all of your pets and animals you're yep. responsible for. Yep. Yep. So this is one of those things, man, where I, I think you could do I think you do like a ten hour debate on like what KISS really means. <laughs> when it's an individual that but, has but, to be responsible for it all. But keep it simple, stupid could be don't buy stuff you don't need. For sure. I that. mean, it's you've never said buy this. You don't probably need it, but it looks cool. Like that's not the message that I've ever heard. And I don't want people to buy it just because so it works for someone else. They might not have the needs for it. So, you know, it's a very general term, keep it simple, but only buy what you need for your system. So I could think of this in a couple of ways, like calcium reactor, man. It's gear. It's cool. It's fun. Yeah. But Dude, like you got a 120 gallon tank, man. Uh, I don't even really know where the payoff is once you consider like right. replacement parts and stuff yeah, like sure. that. Yeah, sure. And a lot of people are mechanically, and I don't want to say a lot of people. It, it it takes a little bit more engineering ability to deal with solenoids, CO2 valves, so potential many leaks. Fail points. Yeah, there, there's more involved. Yeah, yeah so like, I mean, that is not keep it simple. Yeah. It's fun. Cool. Yep. Learn something. Right. But like, it's the, eh. but on a commercial system, that it would be a requirement. It becomes a requirement. Right. Because now you set it and you don't have to touch it for. for it's not viable, months. man. In right. some cases. You right. Know, and you get salinity issues. I can't change the water yeah. as much in this area. Yeah. I have to rely more on filtration yeah. than I do yeah. on that. And I'm just dumping, you know, sodium yeah. chloride in here essentially. Yeah. Right. New things. All right. This one's interesting, too. And I had just read this phrase for the very first time, and I know where you got it from. Uh, what is Lars, and how do we use it to uh, solve small? I'll let you spell out what Lars means. <laughs> so I can't take credit for Lars. My good friend, Joe Ayulo, I think coined the term. If he got it from somewhere else, then he did. But I think he came up with it. Uh, lazy ass reefer syndrome. Mm -hmm. We've all been guilty of it. Myself, you. And I think at its essence would be my tank is running great. This power had stopped working, but the coral still look great. I'll deal with it when I can deal with it. Week goes by, two weeks go by. Huh, tank still looks great. I guess it's not an emergency. I'll put it off. And the next time I do my maintenance, then I'll do it. I'm just too lazy to deal with it. And now your protein skimmer starts producing only big bubbles instead of the fine bubbles. And it's disrupting. and It's not producing foam. Ah, man, I don't have time today. I got to go to the park with my kids. I'll deal with this tomorrow the next day. Tank still looks great. Tank still looks great a week from now, two weeks from now. I'm like, huh, I guess I don't need to do it. And then one more thing happens. And now the lack of flow in this area, the excess buildup of organic waste in the tank, coupled with one thing like your auto water chain stopped working. And now you've got a giant dead coral on this side because there's no flow, the, the nutrients elevated. So the point is fix everything 
as they happen and don't wait for that cumulative effect because when it hits you, it's often nasty and it's merciless. It's like the accumulation, like mortality is so infrequently yep. the result of any one thing. Right. You know, it's like when you end up doing a lot of elements. If the one of stick that knocked bed, the whole Jenga thing down. Yep. Yeah, like a clean sand, well, power head falls down and the clean sand blows it around, no problem. Yep. Uh, sand that has never been maintained and has poor flow or whatever and just filthy and Sulfide filled with blood. Yeah, yeah. Power head falls down, goes in it, blows that, you know, disaster into the tank. Yep. Well, now things have combined. Yeah, you know? yeah. I also think of, uh, I don't know very many reefers who have an experience that you just described, which is I did my water change every month, like you told me, and everything looked good. And then I missed two because of life. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything looked good. Now, granted, most people wouldn't be able to identify the difference between level 10 health and level seven health of a coral. Mm -hmm. Like you, most people couldn't even tell the difference mm -hmm. of that in a human being mm -hmm. yeah. you know, or a dog sure. or so it's a coral. Right. Uh, and so like if you now go to five and whatever, where most people would recognize this isn't going well is when tissue is literally falling off the skeleton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now apply that to your dog. If that's when you figured out yeah. you were doing it bad. Yeah. <laughs> and there's this this bias, this cognitive bias that comes in where we want to justify, oh, I missed water change, but everything still looks good. And it's like you're selectively looking for the things that look the same and ignoring the things that might not look good because your your internal bias wants to justify that it was okay that I missed two weeks of uh, of water changers or well, something. Well, and then one random coral coral just like kicks the bucket and is like contributed to bad luck. Yep. Right. Yeah, you know, like, I don't know. Right. It happens. Right. Uh, well, nah, man, like the pollution's filling up and all these yeah. unknown ions. Your trace element up. levels and are dropping like, if you're not doing it. All kinds of like things are not yeah. going the right way. And slowly, you know, a lot, the healthiest corals you'll never know because you can't really tell the difference in many of them unless you're super, and then super suddenly trained. the giant coral just dies overnight. I mean, you've seen it. I, I've seen it. We have a coral that's doing amazing. And then for seemingly no reason, the whole thing just crapped out, you know. Well, that's the weirdest thing, man. That that is like the accepted cause is, I don't know, it just happened. Like they don't, the animals don't just die that way, right? These are some of these animals can like live a millennia, man. Like live yeah, so can people, but sometimes people just drop dead. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, if you did testing, you'd probably see that there was something building up inside of them, and there were signs. But sometimes, sometimes there's not. Yeah, well, sometimes. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just have a heart attack. It's yeah, true. right. But like, I think that it'd be more helpful for the hobby to stop thinking that it's okay. everybody's having heart attacks in my tank. Right. You know, and start thinking right. like, hmm, what am I not providing in this environment that that would be the reaction to that animal? Because it's it, probably more true than the like, Right. random colony mortality in 24 hours and even if it was a random death which does happen maybe something happened at night who knows uh, you had a creature you didn't even know that came out and started eating it goes away when the light goes on and we think it was no reason but you have to do an investigation just like mm -hmm. in a homicide they don't say oh well we don't really know what happened so we're not going to focus no you need to investigate check all your equipment check your photo period i've had tanks that suddenly go downhill and then you realize you look at the surveillance camera night the lights are never shutting off because somebody switched the damn timer you know you have to do your investigations and a lot of people don't look at temperature even my staff and myself have been guilty we test calcium salinity alkalinity everything is fine you've heard that everything's fine what's the temperature Holy shit, temperature is 83. How did that happen? The heater mm -hmm. malfunction, and we didn't have a Neptune controller on it to tell us, or we just assumed the temperature is always good because it always is good until it isn't. Mm -hmm. Temperature is a huge one. When I did my uh, it was 120 hours at the Camden Aquarium for college, temperature was the first thing we did on every system every day, and we had to log it down. Super important in professional aquaria. It's equally as important in our tanks. So I had a tank that the heater had broke. Right. And then the tank, like day by day, just slowly started taking the dump. Yeah. Just mm. was like, but it was not in a way that I noticed. It was just like, oh, things are deteriorating. And then one yeah. day, like, huh. And then, like, uh, you know, it'd been a month since I'd done my water change, man. I stuck my hand in the water. It's, like it's cold. Oh, man. it's cold. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was cold. And, like, okay. And that's why it took a month to see this problem. Mm. Right. And so, like, you know, my, primary heaters working which is my furnace so it's not you know 60 degrees it's at least 70 you know mm -hmm. in the room that's in 
but like it, it's getting cold. I would have never noticed, man, because there's nothing to tell me. Yep. You know, like other than the biology. You know, like now I would know what to look for a little bit sure. at the time. Well, I you'd have an alert on your controller or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, but like with the controller. Yep. But at minimum, like like if you don't have a controller, like go get one of those like uh, little stickies. But you have to look at it. Yeah. Well, like but that's <laughs> like the you'll thing. stick it on the side of the tank because we don't want to look at it. But what good is it doing if you're not looking at it every day? With like the temperature on your your controller thing, and this time I had like an Eheim one that yeah. was actually in the tank. Yeah, so you can't really see it, but like if you have a digital one, like they're usually hidden somewhere deep inside your stand, and you never right. see it. Yep. You know, like how would you even know? Right. You right. Know? Yeah. So yeah, I think that that uh, Lars element is. Oh, gosh, I don't even really know how to tell you to avoid it. You know, like how do you avoid complacency? You know what, man? I'm sure we're guilty of it right now. I'm sure there's things that a, a bulbous flame or something that could use attention and by itself, it might be insignificant and not might not be part of what's maintaining the system. But again, you couple it with other things and now it's, you know, you're limping and then somebody goes and hits your other leg. Now you, you, you crumble. I think part of it, man, is just owning who you are too. Yeah. Like, you know, you can say to yourself like, no, nope super diligent person and I'm going to do my water changes every month for eternity. I'll never, yeah. you'll never see me stop. Right. I know who I am. You know, that will never happen. Or you just heard that and you're like, <laughs> like that's never happened. And you know what's sad? Right? Is, sorry. Yeah. Well th then own who you are, man. Set up the auto water changer. Yeah. Like, and, and like, I don't know. It's like people have, there's some kind of like aversion to it because you got to run lines around the house or something, man. But like, we just put them in little, you know, those little wire hangers that you get at Home Depot and put them, paint them the same color as the wall, run them along the baseboards, drill a hole through the floor, yep. send them along the, yep. wherever you go. Like, yep. It's super easy to do. And now, like, get, if you get one of those, like, 160-gallon bins, you just, you know, dump a whole bucket of salt in there and mix it up, man. You've got salt now made for most tanks, too, for three months. Yeah. You know, right. three months, four times a year, I need to mix up salt water. It's the only thing I need to do, you know, in this case, to, you know, uh, get rid of my Lars. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I kind of own how lazy I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that will allow you to get rid of some equipment that would be doing the job of the, the auto water change, right? Yeah. Yeah. Simplify it. Oh, like I'm less dependent on the skimmer. Yeah. Oh, so, for instance, uh, I, I was, like some of you have probably heard this too, but like if you do the math and if you do a 10% water change every single week or 35 once a month, the and presuming the the input of food is the same right yep. uh you will never get more pollution than you would get in two months mm -hmm. it, it just dilutes and then it caps out right there and every time you do the water changes it, it just stalls out yep. right about two months it's like just a hair over that okay so that should be adequate for most people mm -hmm. you know like if it doesn't get worse than you get in two months you're probably pretty good mm -hmm. like but, but tend to like feed a lot you yep. know Okay, and this is with no filtration. Mm -hmm. There's no skimmer, no nothing mm -hmm. in that case. Okay, if I did 2% a day, uh, or no, I think it's 1.5%. No, it's 2%. If you did that much a day, it would never get worse than it would get, or well, I'm sorry, in a week. In a single week, if you did 15% a week, it never gets worse than it would get in a single month. Okay. Okay, so never in a single month or 50% once a month, right? It would never get worse in a single month. Nobody's tank's going to crap mm -hmm, in a month, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That means I could, if I wanted to do, keep it simple, st stupid, man, I could get rid of my filter sock, I could get rid of my roller, I could get rid of my refugium, I could get rid of all of it. And the only thing I got is a bin of salt water in my basement yep. or wherever and two and, tubes. Yep, yep. Controller I, changing in and out. That I do four, my, four times a year I fill. Right, right, yep. So different, different. You've created a hybrid open system in, in a way. It's, it's, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. Yep. But you got to feed the same. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you start doing more and more foods and it changes the equation a little bit. It does. Yeah. Well, but the principle is the same. It is. Yeah. The, it, like, all you got to change is the amount of water I've yeah. done. You know, right. and you could say like, oh, you're wasting salt water. Well, I was wasting electricity and time and stuff with the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And like. You know, you might even say it's like more expensive, but like if I never had to buy a refugium light, never bought a you know a skimmer, sure, and never sure. had all to like maintain it, all that up. stuff. Like, yep. yep. Is it really that much different? Right. I don't know. Maybe. Right. All right. Next one here is identifying the difference between 
a you know taking from the the your farm and bringing it home uh, the difference between a winning formula settling for less or chasing fads how do you identify the difference between that and how do you not mess it up if you have one of these things uh, i think a lot of it comes down to planning and you know for for us we know what works for us obviously there's new technology and everything coming out but i see a lot of people try something for a couple of months or or for a short period of time and when they don't see the results they switch you know they get the refugium and then you know they still have nitrate so they shut down the refugium and then they get a uh, bio pellet reactor and then you know they don't go down quick enough so they get rid of the bio pellet reactor and they do the auto water change it's like you got to pick something and do it right and have your attention to detail dialed in to do it the way it's intended to be done and give it a chance to actually work because all these methods work. They've been proven to work if you do them correctly. So for us, we don't chase fads and we know what works. And as soon as something new comes out, we wait. We don't want to be the guinea pigs. We want to make sure that it proves itself and it has a place in our husbandry before we get rid of one practice and adopt something else. This is interesting because I mean, I, in some ways, feel responsible for fads. Yeah. You know, because we go and well, test new technology. you thing to people. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, we recently tested in the back, you know, using ozone. You know, we did it in six different ways. We did it, you know, with like two tanks that didn't have any ozone. You watch the water get totally yellow. We did one that kept the ozone at 450 uh, millivolts or whatever it was in the ORP. And, you know, it water's crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And this is after many months. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think it's like almost six months. Wow. Okay. Then the uh, uh, one that's 350s, kind of murky. And then, like, we get all the way down to one of these things. Like, all you do is set it up and to feed into your skimmer, you know, and turn it on for an hour at mm -hmm. 3 a.m. Mm. And now that water's crystal clear, too. Mm. Okay. So once I show that data to everybody that you could have crystal wa clear water, 100% of the time, you don't have to worry about the ozone and stuff because it's only turned on for an hour in the middle of the night, yep. you know. Uh, I feel like new fad coming, Yeah, you know. But is it a new fad because we've been using ozone or people have been using ozone for so many years. Um, I think what, I, what makes it a fad is when people use it, probably don't use it well or use the right size or they don't use enough milligrams per hour and then it goes away. That in itself becomes a fad. I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to uh, attribute right or wrong to it, and, and it's not the right thing. Well, I, you know, here's the problem is, like, I want to be the guinea pig. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's our responsibility to be the yeah. guinea pig. Like, yeah. hey, dude, if we're going to use this stuff, we should figure out how to use it to the best of our right. ability, and we should share it with you guys, uh, and we should probably share it in real time, you know? And I can't help but know that some people, uh, the other trailblazers that have that DNA in them like yeah. I do, I'm gonna run out and do it. Yep. You know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, because you're helping confirm whatever we're doing. Right. But man, is it not? It's it's so compelling when you see some of the results of these things to not want to chase the next yep. cool thing. Yep. Or, like I think of the Destaco uh, calcium, calcium reactor. Yeah. So I have this calcium reactor that has, you know, all the stuff on it, man, and I gotta control this thing and that thing and the other thing. And then I see the Destaco one that like kind of self-regulates almost. Yeah. How do I not want that? Right, right. But the one you have is working. Yeah. Ah. I know. How do you not chase the fads? It's hard. I mean, if it was easy, we wouldn't be. I mean, it wouldn't be a thing. But from a commercial aspect, we would have to shift so much over. It's a giant cost, and the risk is so great. You know, when we got a 30-foot raceway of corals, we can't afford to take chances. So trying it on a smaller setup, a smaller tank, you can correct a lot quicker. We can't correct that. It's like trying to steer a cruise ship versus a 15-foot ship. You could change direction like this. Cruise ship, you got to go wide. And, and so I'm coming, the context is coming from a commercial application. Well, let me think about this part. So I'm trying to find some middle ground here, sure. right? Okay. Don't solve theoretical problems. Solve real ones. Yeah. Is is it a problem? We often ask. Yeah. Are you trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist? Yeah. You know. Okay. So like, you know, like I heard the new light came out. The new fancy this thing has that thing. Some better phone app or How whatever. Is your existing have on light, it, right? right? Okay. Is does your existing light serve your needs? Is it growing the coral? Are the right. bases healthy? Are the inner network of the coral healthy? You're getting the coloration you want. Everything is going well. 
Okay, if the answer is yes to that, man, the chances of you improving upon it, almost certainly when you change the light, it's actually gonna go south. Yep. It is not yep. gonna get better. Yep. But if you have problems, you know, the bases are not doing well, the, uh, you know, in the network of it is not doing well, the color is not good, and you know full well you have this weird little Eiffel Tower of only royal blue in there, which is really abnormal to the biology of the animal. Well, sell that. Man. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, and I tell people all the time, even the products that I sell, if your tank is running good and you don't have a problem with this, why consider it? Spend your money elsewhere. Like, don't fix something that's not broken. It's just... It's common sense, you know, it should be common sense. Okay, well, I mean, you can even get down to like some of the KISS stuff. Like, all right, so if you're adding top off water every day by hand, you know, I just got a bin and I just go dump it in and it's working for you every day, don't implement the auto top yeah. off. There's yeah. no need. You're happy right. and it's, it's working, working just fine for yep. you. Now, if uh, every single week, you know, you walk up to the tank and the only time you add top off water is because the power heads are spraying water all over your wall and it's gurgling. That's not working for yeah, you, man. Yep. Solve that problem. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Like our needs are different that you just touched upon. Why we try to keep it simple at our shop. Um, on the coral farms, we don't have auto top off. And you say, might say, well, why not? Well, because I don't know if we need salt water or if we need fresh water. What if they bagged a lot of corals? They took water out of that system. I would rather somebody test with a refractometer every day and determine how much salt or how much fresh we need to add. Sure, mm. we could predict and just have it auto top off with fresh for evaporative loss, but that could steer us into, now I don't have somebody testing with a refractometer, and before we know it, we could be at 1.028, 1.022. So testing every day, it's likely I mean, to it's go harder low, to mess up. You're in, in those bags of coral and fish you're sending, or coral you're sending, you are exporting salt water. Yeah. You would not want an auto top of water to replace Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But there's still evaporative loss. So yeah. you need to do, you know, there's a little bit of both. We've got a ton of service Totally area. did a different challenge here. Yep. Uh, so, like, if when the answer here was uh, identify the difference between a winning formula. If you're winning already and you don't have any problems, don't solve them. You don't have any problems. Yeah. Uh, but somebody could say, well, well, what if I want to make it a little bit better? Isn't that the goal? That's the piece here of settling for less. Yeah. So identify if you're settling for less, like the biology doesn't look good and the corals aren't behaving the way or you're doing work you don't want to do. Yeah. We'll solve that. Yeah. But chasing fads, just the word of fad inherently is negative. Don't right. do that. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Next one here is who are the most productive employees in the farm? Hint, they work for poo, algae, and parasites. <laughs> most productive employees this, at the farm. This touches back to what we, you know, the message that's been put forth is use nature to fight natural problems. So instead of using elbow grease to scrub algae, maybe use urchins, use turbo snails, use grazers. You know, instead of taking corals out and dipping them and using employees, use natural uh, solutions, six line wrasses, camel shrimp, um, something less invasive than taking the coral out and exposing it to hydrogen peroxide or Bayer or whatever people are using now. Um, so exhaust your natural employees before using the other employees. Yeah, they all work for almost free. Yeah. Uh, they all do. day long. And they enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, just eating the algae Happy all day rass. long. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, I did a video on this recently. I think it might have been with Than, but, uh, you know, we talked about that, you know, like, you know, Fight an algae, dude. It's really just like, how do my different mouth shapes can I get in there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, get the bristle tooth mouth, sure. the scraping, the get yeah. the uh, zebra somas, like it's like the yellow tang that's gonna you know pull leaf, on it. Leaf grabbing. Yeah. Or whatever. And like get the different mouths in there, and you probably won't have algae. And then like somebody responded in the comments with, "Stop lying to people. Like uh, that's not true." And I'm like, "Wow, dude. Like, how could you come to that conclusion?" And then. I just came to me right now. Like, not all employees are good. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say. Well, you know, there's you know, problematic like the some, algae. Well, there's also some, like bryopsis that some of the fish just won't eat. Yeah, you know, they they won't go after it the same way. Right. Well, they hit different stages in right. life. You know? Well, when, you know, we're, we're talking about like the bell curve. We're talking about 80% of the algae and problems. There's always going to be the bryopsis or the stubborn hair algae mm -hmm. that no fish is going to want to eat. And that's when you got to roll up your sleeves, Google something, too. and then get in there and get invasive. Add a chemical, get the rock out, scrub it, peroxide. But we're talking about trying to do as much as we can with the least amount of work. And a lot of these algae that people suffer with could be combated, and parasites could be combated with natural, simple remedies. 
Well, it's, it's funny because you, if you think about like the fish as uh, your, you know, your tanks cleaner, <laughs> for lack of better words, employee, uh, you know, it's, they're, they're eating it all day. Some of them are going to have a taste for hair algae and some of them are gonna have a taste for bryopsis. The bryopsis one is way rarer, yeah. you know? Sure. I mean, like it's not working for you. Yeah. It's not that the council's bad. It's just like swap the fish out with yeah. one that maybe has a taste for right. this. You know, I think of, uh, uh, what's the little Blenny, the lawnmower Blenny? You know, for instance, like a lot of people will say that they'll eat them when they're small. They'll go after the algae, but as they get bigger, they just kind of get lazy. Mm -hmm. And especially they get trained that like mice shrimp is coming. I in, see you know, that. I remember the one with the big belly just sitting there, just yeah. where like a patch of algae right next to him, just sitting there with his belly, just yo, you gonna feed me or what? <laughs> yeah, they just we kind of trained them to be lazy. Right. You know, they, like so there's different kind of stages, but like I think that's one of the things is like when we think of this council is it's like a surefire thing. Like any old wrasse is gonna eat all the flatworms or any old wrasse is gonna eat all of the zoanthid nudibranx or whatever. Like, not true. No. You know, it's likely, Yeah. Uh, but some of them, man, and just why don't is do that? that? And the answer could be is where those fish were collected, maybe for those reefs, that parasite hadn't has never been there. So they haven't evolved a taste for that or something. You know, we like to think of all six iron rats the same, but what is their geographic region that they're collected in? And what food item were they exposed to? You shared with this uh, about the Moorish Idol with yes. me earlier today. Yes, so what I heard, not firsthand, but what I heard is Moorish Idols could be collected from coral reef habitats or rocky lagoon. Like in Hawaii, there's a ton of rocky sea bass, seagrass lagoon areas. Those Moorish idols tend to do better in captivity because they can eat a variety of food, a lot of rubble and stuff. Whereas in beautiful tropical coral reefs, they're feeding more predominantly on coral polyps. They're, so their metabolism and dietary needs have shifted over time, you know, as they evolve. So it's, 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 two different same species but really they're slowly evolving differently and when you look over time you know they could almost become different species depending on the environmental pressures that are applying to these fish that's how new species happen we just happen to take a snapshot today and say these are all the species but really everything's changing everything's adapting everything's evolving well you know it's just like i eat corn in the cob because it was presented to me as food you know mm -hmm. i've all i've always ever known is corn in the cob is food but what if that never had been presented to me, you know, and then you just like showed me this like ear of corn right. wrapped in green stuff. that's super high fibers. Would I even know how to eat it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. cook it. And so like those fish, it's not just evolution. It's just habits based yeah. on what they've been eating for the last yeah. three years. Yeah. You know, as availability of food, mm -hmm. like you put them in your tank. Now they're going to eat some coral. Mm -hmm. Now, again, like, is this always true? Is it always true for all? Nope. Some of those fish that were collected were, you know, there's plenty of algae for them. Mm -hmm. They ate the algae or the yep. sponge, yep. you know? Yep. Yep. Uh, but you learn. I think that's important though, is think about that all of these things try to, I mean, like if, if I could start like a tank in most cases, it's just from the beginning. I'd start with an aptasia eating file fish, just for the assumption that maybe that's one of those things that's gonna make their way in there. Typically, just gonna, yeah. 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 I'm gonna start with some tangs. Uh, they're just going to eat the algae that I know full well is going to come. I would probably throw in uh, like a yellow green cor or green chorus wrasse or a uh, uh, like a melanaris wrasse to eat flatworms mm -hmm. and nudies and stuff that are very likely to come in. Those fish jump, so put a lid on, but like they're inexpensive. I love the yellow ones. They're bright and colorful mm -hmm. uh, and they're really aggressive at going after little things that move on the yep. rocks. Yep. Uh, I mean, there's a handful of these fish that like, if you put these things in here, you know, like you don't even think of like a mandarin. You don't think of a mandarin as eating a predator, but there's lots of predatory copepods, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so they're just hunting these things down yeah. all day. Pipe fish, yeah. same thing, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, have them clean up your tank. And start the tank off. I like to start at dark, you know, keep those lights to a minimum. Let mm -hmm. that biofilm grow. Don't let the photosynthetic stuff that could be on the rock go crazy. And then turn those lights up slowly. Have your 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 warriors already in there to do battle, and you'll you'll do well. Lessons learned from the fish store that's going to come, or from the farm rather, that's going to go home. 
Uh, don't worry, there is more to come. There's another episode. So in the 52 full playlist of F52SE right here, they're just going to keep on coming. Joe's coming back.